most theories of consciousness um, will admit that there is this glossing over of the gap, which is why it's described as the hard problem in the first place, because because it's um, yeah. Yeah. yeah tricky to 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 vault that that chasm, um, which is why you know you mentioned my uh, my paper earlier that uh, for me I'm willing to uh, grant consciousness intuitively. You know I feel it, um, comfortable granting it to the whole natural world um, because. I think it does offer a solution, but also because we spoke earlier at the very beginning about kind of um, in the 60s, you said kind of spiritual experiences through kind of meditation and psychedelics got you interested in these systems views. And a core aspect of that for a lot of people is the idea of, is the sense of the loss of, of self and the fact that consciousness remains when the self is gone, which is in large part what makes me feel um, it's not necessary to have uh, yeah, to have this complex sense of self in order to have consciousness. Yeah, this is this is a, a, a well-known position, and and I think uh, the different theories of consciousness uh, place the heart problem, the emergence of the inner world. Uh, at different levels of of living systems, and so uh, what you are saying is uh, you place it at the beginning of life, right? That every every yeah. living system is a conscious system, yeah. and there are spiritual traditions or indigenous traditions that go even further and say it's there all the time. So they would say. Well, a tree is alive, of course, but a rock is not alive. And they would say a rock is conscious too. And, and so matter is conscious. And so they, uh, they solve the heart problem by saying there is no gap because everything is conscious. But of course, that's not an explanation. If you say everything, everything has a certain property, then, you know, the property is not explained. You just posit it. So uh, what, what I don't understand in your view of uh, what you call the living mirror theory is, well, there, there are several things I, I have problems with. And, and one is that if you associate consciousness with self-awareness, then it seems to me uh, uh, there needs to be, well, first of all, you need to have some evidence that say there's self-awareness in cells. I don't see an evidence for that. I see an evidence that a bacterium is aware of its environment, of certain features of its environment, very limited features. And as life gets more complex, those features become more and more complex. But I don't see an evidence of a bacterium or even a plant being aware of itself. Even, even uh, animals are not aware of, it, of themselves apparently, but you know, chimpanzees are aware of themselves and apes the, in general are aware of themselves. So, so do you associate self-awareness with consciousness? And if so, what's the evidence? Yeah, so I think, yeah, this is an important maybe matter of definition, because for me, uh, self-awareness is, is not necessary for consciousness. You know, this is what I was referring to with these spiritual states um, earlier. So, you know, consciousness to me is experience, any qualitative feeling. Um, and so, you know, a human can have this experience of, of consciousness without a sense of self in, in the spiritual states we mentioned. Um, but so I, I don't think it's necessary for consciousness. And you know, I think it's a it's a phenomenon that appears within consciousness that is incredibly captivating to us. Um, and the average person can't imagine experience without the sense of self. I think, understandably, but it is yeah. it does exist, which is why you know I agree that um, plants aren't self reflective or you know, don't have those complex kind of cognitive structures that arise with nervous systems. But I would say I do think every living system does have some degree of self perception, maybe you could say, in the sense that any kind of autopoetic system, you know, needs to know to metabolize things from the external environment and not to metabolize its own membrane. You know, there is some discrimination there between the organism and the outside. Um, but 
that is, I agree, that's different to a complex cognitive representation of the whole organism. Yes, there is, of course, there is a, a, a distinction. This is why we talk about self-organization and, and self-making. I mean, the auto in autopoiesis is, means self. So a self is very critical. And in the theory of autopoiesis, uh, the boundary is a boundary of identity. In the case of a cell of molecular identity, the cell membrane um, defines the molecular identity of the self, of the cell. So the self is, is very important. But I think uh, I understand you now, and, and I think it would be worth really examining the features of consciousness that are not self-awareness and how self-awareness is placed within those features, how it arises and so on. Uh, that would be really interesting. Now the yeah. other, the other, let me ask you the other question. The other uh, problem I had in, in understanding or accepting what you say is, you, you write, Consciousness arises from the entropy resisting dynamics of living systems. It is not dependent on brains. So what you're referring to is the fact that uh, living systems create order out of disorder. We have the famous second law of thermodynamics, which says closed systems will move from a state of order to increasing disorder. And this is measured by entropy. As the uh, disorder increases, so does the entropy, which is a measure of disorder. And so uh, the, the big discovery of, one of the big discoveries of Ilya Prigozhin uh, was that uh, he could explain how life creates order of disorder without violating the second law of thermodynamics. First of all, living systems are open systems and the second law deals with closed systems. That's a big difference. But Prigozhin showed in, in a detailed mathematical theory for which he got the Nobel Prize, he showed how a living system um, forms what he calls islands of order in a sea of increasing disorder. So the disorder is exported from the system and is dissipated. And this is why he calls living systems dissipative structures. So, so this is, I think, what you're referring to when you say the entropy resisting dynamics of living systems. But the problem I have now is that dissipative structures are not necessarily alive. There are phenomena called Benar cells that Prigogine has worked with, or so-called chemical clocks, oscillating chemical systems, which are not alive, but are dissipative structures. So this entropy resisting dynamics is not limited to living systems. It occurs before the emergence of life. And then, according to you, these, these non-living dissipative structures would also be conscious. Well, I, so I think in, in that line, that line alone, um, yeah, if you, if, if you take that line alone, it, it sounds like I'm saying, I'm making the point that it's only the, the, the process of entropy resistance that produces consciousness. But the, the point of that sentence was to say that the brain is kind of incidental. The brain is a secondary, you know, uh, phenomenon. The brain is a kind of important part of the network, but it's not uh, the thing that brings consciousness into existence. And so the, the theory as a whole is saying that rather than just resisting entropy or just being a dis dissipative structure, um, we can understand bounded dissipative structures like cells, like whole organisms. Um, and this is, this is best articulated in Carl Friston's free energy principle, which I write about in, in the theory. And so it's, it's the presence of this boundary um, and the fact that that boundary, um, certain parts of that network, certain parts of the boundary become kind of sensing and other parts, you know, are involved in action. And that that process, that particular way of, of um, 
maintaining form through minimization of free energy, that entails inference. It entails uh, the internal states kind of acting as a model, you could say, of, of the outside world or constructing beliefs about the outside world. Um, and then the, the kind of the, the other key point is, is actually from what we were talking about a lot here is the idea of interdependence. I think, you know, um, part of the problem of, of thinking about consciousness is thinking of, you know, if you take the experience of red in isolation, it's hard to understand how that arises out of the operation of the material world. But if you understand the contents yeah. of consciousness as an interdependent framework where it's relativistic, everything is cashed out against everything else, in the same way that we can get reality out of a quantum vacuum through through this kind of interdependent pattern, I understand consciousness to be a similar kind of pattern in this bounded structure. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there's a, a lot of similarity with with the Maturana's autopoiesis, uh, because autopoiesis is a, uh, a an autopoietic system is a system that is self generating within a boundary of its own making. That's how it is defined. So the formation of the boundary is very important. And, and I now remember that uh, very early on, Maturana referred to these systems as self-referential. Mm. So that's, that's also close to, I, I don't think I use the term in any of my books when I talk about autopoiesis, but Maturana so, himself, I remember, uses the term self-referential. Right. So, so Matur that's also. Yeah, and Maturana's view was, it, he had this interesting idea that consciousness arises as a kind of inherently communicative social phenomenon, right? You write about that uh, yes, in your yes, books as well. Yes, that, that's right, yes. Yeah, with language. Consciousness right. arises with language, and language is a special form of symbolic communication. And he first analyzes communication, and then language, and that's the emergence of consciousness. Right. 